There are aspects of a research project that may be refined by first-hand reflective observation. In this project, that otherwise easily achieved opportunity has been denied me. If it were not for Covid lockdown, I would have already visited Persia to absorb anything and everything I could about Okhtatai House near Kreef and its landscape. I'm convinced that such a trip would have refined my understanding of the differences between Okhtatai where I live and the one that has emerged as central to my thesis, as well as get a feel for music making at a grand Scottish household when Robert Burns was active. Indeed, he visited the house and George's occupied the British throne. Thanks to our friend COVID-19, that has not been possible and even armchair travel with Google Earth Street View was an unhelpful alternative to being there because the braes in question are barely visible in the view from the A85 and anyway the scene is obscured by roadside trees. However, the hideous patchily burnt grouse moors that are the braes today show clearly in the aerial view. Those braes no longer live up to the closing line of an anonymous schoolgirl's poem how charming are the lovely braes of Bonnie Ochtatire. The first thing I did when finding James Scott Skinner's manuscript of a Strass Bay entitled The Braes of Ochtatire was try to determine if the title referred to my local Ochtatire Hill. Evidence soon showed that that was unlikely, so I set the page aside for many years until lockdown in 2021. Until I can adequately illustrate Ochtatire Kreef, and because, contrarily, I have masses of images showing my home West Highland Octatire, I will make use of the latter, more though for decoration and local celebration than for historical accuracy. Please don't be misled by this incongruity. I intend one day to revise this presentation, focusing on the more appropriate Octatire. There is a fine old fiddle tune with an evolutionary history of at least 300 years, the Braes of Octatire. We residents of Loch Ausch might easily jump to the conclusion that those braes are our Ochtatire hills, but let's not beat about the bush. That misapprehension soon proved decisively wrong, as did several interim historical conclusions erroneously reached and discounted as the increasingly complicated project evolved. What I at first thought should have been a straightforward quest for a background story to a single Strass Bay turned into a convoluted brain teaser, deficient in unequivocal evidence. One of the features of Highland isolation at a time of Covid lockdown is that the only information available is provided by the internet. No libraries. But there was access to excellent primary sources in facsimile form, generously provided by holders of rare publications, notably the National Library of Scotland's Glen Collection. Secondary online sources can be less reliable and sometimes, after laborious comparison and verification of content, turn out to be flawed. Plentiful as online information might be, and it certainly is, it's littered with errors and hasty presumptions proliferated by inadequately critical plagiarism. Nevertheless, the tune The Braes of Octatire has a fascinating history that proved well worth investigating. So what questions might we ask about our tune? Is the Octatire of the tune's title the Octatire where I live? If not, which was it? There are six. How, where and when did the tune come into being? How did it evolve? And what can we determine of its social history and related music? Was the Miss Murray, who emerges as a significant player in that social history, a performer, a composer, or just a popular young socialite for whom musicians cheerfully and prolifically wrote dance music? And then, which was she of the two Miss Murrays at Ochtatire? And how much more could we find out, given more time, energy and resources? This relatively recent version of the tune is in a manuscript in the collection of the famous Scottish fiddler James Scott Skinner, 1843 to 1927. In accordance with an instruction scribbled at the bottom of the page, I've completed the empty bars and the accompaniment. Skinner's own performance survives, recorded onto a wax cylinder around 1903, but I'm afraid that's not a particularly entertaining rendition and probably best considered only of academic interest. Here it is as a computer-generated performance for violin and Klasach, the Celtic harp, transcribed from Skinner's manuscript with, to keep the eyes entertained, a brief photographic tour of Ochtatire in Loch Ausch. <laughs>
Braes, as in the Braes or Tyre, are pleasant hillsides that are too low to count as mountainous. Wouldn't it be marvellous if the composer of this ancient tune was celebrating our Ochtatire hills in the Highland Council district known as Sky and Loch Alsh? Well, that soon turned out to be not the case. Anyway, here in the Highlands, we don't have braes, a southern Scots expression. Geographical features here generally have Gaelic names. Before getting underway, I want to acknowledge the limitations of this project. Since posting a first version on YouTube, which at the time seemed satisfactory, revisiting the evidence and plenty of overnight sleeping on it and rethinking revealed difficulties and new ideas that, once recognised, led to complete reinterpretation of the tune's ancestries. That could happen again, but hopefully what follows will be more accurate, yet will always be provisional. A study of this sort should take much longer than a few weeks, two or three years might be more appropriate, and requires better access to information and a lot more analysis, ideally under the guidance of an experienced PhD supervisor. Still, I'll carry on and do my best with the resources I have, hoping that somebody will be inspired to pursue the inquiry further, wider and better. I will present my conclusions, but please don't expect them to be entirely correct or final. Consider them interim, provisional, work in progress, a springboard for future research. James Scott Skinner, whose late 19th century version we have just heard, attributed the tune to Crockett, who it has been considered without much corroboration I can find, was one James Crockett. For further information, we turn to the 1839 edition of Volume 3 of James Johnson's The Scots Musical Museum, in which the name Crockett as in Mrs Crockett, the owner of a manuscript music book dated 1709, is mentioned in connection with 14 tunes out of 100, along with commentary we might, with caution, find informative. I'll be referring quite often to Johnson's six-volume Scots Musical Museum. It's a remarkable labour of love for his native music, valued in its day as now. It's a collection of 600 old and new Scots songs, compiled to a significant degree in collaboration with Robert Burns, and provided with valuable commentary by our William Stenhouse. Stenhouse was already dead by the time Johnson published this later edition, including the notes, and as editor he seems to have reworked the information they contain, so that it isn't easy to tell whether ideas are his or Stenhouse's. Johnson tells us that this James Crockett, manuscript owner Mrs Crockett's son, added a tune, How Can I Keep My Maidenhead?, to his mother's tune book around the year 1723. Note, around the year 1723. There's quite a lot in this discussion of, oh dear mother, what shall I do? So rather than trawl through it, I'll put a link below to Johnson's book, pages 221 to 223 of the second part. Alternatively, you can pause here and read. We actually have two publishers called Johnson, so it would be necessary to differentiate them. The aforementioned James Johnson in Edinburgh from 1787 and another I'm going to mention soon, John Johnson of London, 1748. For the time being, until the other crops up, Johnson will refer to James Johnson. On Johnson's page 41, we are told about this probably important manuscript book which an autograph dated 1709 confirms belonged to that Mrs Crockett. He says that it is now in the editor's, presumably Johnson's, possession. But further on, on page 110, we learn that the book is now in the possession of antiquarian Charles Kirkpatrick Sharp Esquire. And then by page 222, which we've just seen, it's back in the possession of the editor. As far as I can tell, it hasn't been seen since then, probably earlier than 1839. But that might be simply because it's squirrelled away somewhere in a private collection or library vault. It's important, unrecognised. Note the caution with which Johnson cites the date, 1723. Some internet sources present an inadequately referenced version of what they have labelled as the Braes of Ochtatire. Well, it pretty well is, but it's not Crockett's tune. With Johnson's estimated date as exact, with the composer's name attributed, and they provide a title that's not Crockett's. Rather transparently, all plagiarised from one to another without checking. What a muddle. So, way back in the 1780s, Johnson, or was it Stenhouse, 
recognised relationships between How Can I Keep My Maidenhead in Mrs Crockett's Manuscript with the dance Lennox Love to Blantyre, three songs involving Minnie, Mother and Peggy and our Straspe, the Braes of Ochtertyre. After, according to scientific convention, I tried to falsify Johnson's hypothesis, I concluded that the six tunes Johnson cited are indeed the significant group. He was right. But how are they related? As a biologist, I suggest we should analyse our data with a tried and tested biological theory. Working out the emergence and development of tunes is a study in evolution, no different from the evolution of life, which was succinctly defined by Darwin as descent with modification. Now please lay the biology textbook aside and listen to Baba Brinkman, a rap artist who understands evolution profoundly and in the context of his own performances. His summary of evolution, performance, feedback, revision, is the ideal way to understand the evolution of our six tunes. Yes, I am a rap artist. Don't panic. Um, the way this works is uh, I got an approach last fall by a professor of microbiology who asked if I would write some raps to help celebrate Charles Darwin's 200th birthday. Uh, so all winter I sent him copies of my rap lyrics and he came back with corrections, which means my hip-hop show is peer-reviewed. So when I first started writing these evolution raps back in January, early drafts of my script were quite simple. They weren't so complex. One of my early drafts of the rap sounded like this. Yo, yo, the origin of species ain't no feces, dog. believe me. Whoa. But that was all I could think of. So then I was like, damn, this really needs to be rewritten. And sometimes people ask me, okay, how does your show get written? Like this, performance, feedback, revision. And how do I generally develop my lyricism? Like this, performance, feedback, revision. And how do human beings ever learn to do anything? Like this. Performance, feedback, revision. And evolution is really just kind of an algorithm that goes like this. Performance, feedback, revision. So the genetic code of every living creature was also written like this. Performance, feedback, revision. See, the genes are like a text with 100,000 pages. And revisions occur in the random changes that come from mutations. And when they see the light, that's the performance. That's the phenotype. And natural selection, well, that's the feedback side. That's about who survives and whose genes catch rise in the next generation. Yes, what I'm saying is that a rap performance like this is the best illustration for the way that descent with modification works. Because the performance is necessary to change the words, to decide which have an impact, and which to send back to the drawing board. In fact, I just did that when you failed to react. Because any line can change. And mutations occur when I improvise on stage. Because up until this moment, everything I said was off the page. But now it's time for me to switch it up and do a little freestyle section. I'm going to try to make it specific so that I can beat your cheater detection. Yes, I might be a bit of a tough act to follow at the Hammersmith Apollo. That's why the interval's next. But I'm a massive apostle of science. Yeah, that's the way that it goes with these craziest flows. This is me just improvising, trying to say what I I know, and when I make a mistake, that just does me rocking the rhythm and trying to introduce a little bit of mutation into the system. That's just how a tune changes over time, and new tunes arise. Performance, feedback, revision. On and on over time, descent with modification. If a tune is liked, it gets copied, with errors and improvements included, the equivalent of mutations. The tune gradually adapts according to its qualities and popularity, at first changing subtly, later radically as the modifications accumulate. If new versions are favoured by audience preference, natural selection, they remain in the repertoire, the gene pool, eventually undergoing further change and selection, performance, feedback, revision. Meanwhile, disagreeable and redundant variants fizzle out and become extinct. Disused but not entirely vanished, we still find them in old books, the equivalent of fossils. After numerous iterations or generations and the passage of time, very little of the first common ancestor is recognisable, particularly if the tune has become isolated geographically by, for instance, the Atlantic Ocean. Thus, in a nutshell, the fossil tune, How Can I Keep My Maidenhead, which of course had its own ancestral history, now lost in time or yet to be discovered, 
after a few hundred years of performance, feedback, revision, is now represented by its almost unrecognisable living American descendant, Billy in the low ground. It's the multi-branching bit in between that presents us with so many tantalising uncertainties, but that's evolution for you. Its mechanism can be easily understood, while the explanation we want to extract from fragmentary evidence can be complex and elusive. So the evolution of tunes is similar to the evolution of life, but it never was like this hackneyed old march of progress illustration, which is entirely and unequivocally wrong. At a stroke, the 1965 creator of this silly picture became responsible for decades of public misunderstanding of science. When properly illustrated, evolution of anything creates a branching pattern rather like this, albeit simplified, ascent of humans. I've tried to present the genealogy of our tunes in similar fashion, but I'm not confident we have enough data. So first, by entering as much data as I can muster into a spreadsheet, I've created a simple scatter plot which formalises what I know at present of the emergencies, extinctions and lifelines of the Braes of Ochtatire and the five ancestral tunes recognised by Johnson. Interesting patterns certainly emerged. These tunes divide naturally into two distinct but conspicuously related classes, four-square dances and triple-time songs. These two features provide a basic classification to work with, but the limited information available makes it impossible to detect any common ancestry for these tunes, which will have existed somewhere off to the left of the chart and waiting to be discovered, and it would be irresponsible to assign granddaddy of them all status to any of the six or be pedantic about how they are interrelated. However, I think we may fairly conclude that the Braes of Octatire arose somewhere within the five earlier forms and to an extent we can refine that idea. Maidenhead, Minnie, Mother and Peggy, perhaps significantly all of them songs, all had their day and then became extinct within a few decades. Historical relics by the time they were recorded by music historians Robert Burns and James Johnson in the 1790s. The three dance tunes, Maidenhead, it was dual purpose, Lennox Love to Blantyre and the Braes of Octatire persisted and evolved further as they became established in the country dancing repertoire of Strathspeys. Lennox Love, which in one manuscript is identical to Maidenhead, so in a way that old tune survived longer than is plotted here, has been revived in historical dance circles, while Octatire is entirely current, as itself in Scotland and as derivatives across the Atlantic. As we analyse these old publications and the music they contain, we should bear in mind that the aforementioned Crockett was probably not the composer of the tune he labelled How Can I Keep My Maidenhead, but in the manner of his time was reusing an already established song or dance tune. Indeed, that is so, but as ever, the subcritical interplagiarising factions on the internet are wrong. He never called it the Braes of Octatire. That came significantly later. Johnson or perhaps Stenhouse, with the manuscript in his hands, says his title was How Can I Keep My Maidenhead? In telling us about it, he was just able to suppress his distaste with the words of the song. James Crockett gave his real tune the strange title of How Can I Keep My Maidenhead? which was the first line of an old and delicate song now deservedly forgotten. The verses had already been recorded by Robert Burns around the same time as Crockett, so I turned to my Victorian copy of the National Burns to discover that, doubtless thanks to Dr Bowdler's influence, the song had been omitted. But, Johnson would be disappointed, those deservedly forgotten and delicate words have been rediscovered by the internet, two versions of which this is the less naughty, the other is rather closer to properly obscene. Johnson's text says that Crockett's manuscript was in the possession of the editor. Lord knows where it is now. I found just three extant examples bearing Crockett's title, How Can I Keep My Maidenhead? One in this undateable manuscript where it is, intriguingly, also called Lennox Love to Blantyre. If you overlook the upbeats that begin each section, it's strikingly similar to the earliest and simplest form of Lennox Love in the Duke of Perth's manuscript of 1734. This coincidence of titles is a gift to the researcher confronted by an evidence-deficient data set and the manuscript a pleasing connection with a real individual musician of the past. We may decipher the puzzling title of this reel 
once we discover the history of Lennox Love House, south of Haddington, East Lothian, which was for 200 years the seat of the Lord's Blantyre. The property, which includes a splendid 14th century keep, was bought in 1702 for the impoverished 5th Lord of Blantyre by his aunt, the Duchess of Richmond and Lennox, who named the place Lennox's Love to Blantyre, later abbreviated to Lennox Love. We can only wonder by what date post-1702, which is very early in our present historical context, the title of an existing tune was, as was common practice, changed to the name of the house, and what that tune might once have been. At a later date, maybe the same thing happened at Octatire House. Did the Murray family, we'll meet them soon, rename Lennox Love to Blantyre as the braise of their own estate? A slightly more complex How Can I Keep My Maiden Head is this printed version in an English dance book, John Johnson's Caledonian Country Dances of 1748. Once again, if, for the purposes of comparison, we overlook the upbeats and smooth the dotted rhythm, a similarity with Lennox Love can be seen. Encouragingly, both tunes also bear similarities to The Braise of Octatire. Either Maidenhead might be based on Crockett's now missing manuscript, or the other way round, or there's a third possibility I haven't yet detected. To facilitate comparison, here are four tunes tacked together. One, the manuscript Maidenhead, followed by two, the simple 1734 Duke of Perth version of Lennox Love, then three, Johnson's Maidenhead, finished off with four, Neil Gow's 1805 version of Octatire. Having made preliminary comparisons of Maidenhead, Lennox Love and Octatire, next the two tunes Octatire and Lennox Love. My provisional conclusion is that Lennox Love is probably the ancestor out of Maidenhead of Octatire. I found two publications in which the two tunes occur together and are therefore contemporary and presumably considered by the publishers to be separate entities, which shows they surely are different. Here are the two tunes in late 18th century Robert Petrie's collection and next in the almost contemporary complete repository of Neil Gow. Structurally these tunes are diverging. Lennox Love disappears before 1900, though picked up later by revivalists, while Octatire remains in the repertoire, accompanying the Scottish diaspora across the Atlantic. There's a whole separate study in that. As I was completing this revised presentation, I checked the Vicar's manuscript in a Gateshead archive where I triumphantly found Maidenhead and Lennox Love, therefore in versions that were contemporary and could be compared. Then, accidentally, another version of Octatire turned up in the same collection, slightly later but perhaps geographically related, Northumberland. The Vicar's Maidenhead is almost identical to our other two examples, while Lennox Love has morphed into something a little weird, but it certainly is still Lennox Love. It's quite possible that the tune hasn't been copied correctly. The strange stroke or blot between the F-sharp and the opening upbeat is not a C-sharp, but part of the faded time signature symbol for 2-2. The very faded octatire has its usual features while being quite plain and unadorned, dotted rhythms and decoration being left to the fiddler. Here I can detect features common to Maidenhead and Lennox Love, and then Lennox Love and Octatire. 
The descending bouncing phrase followed by a downward semiquaver run occurs in both of the latter pairing but placed in slightly different positions. I'd be interested to know what a proper musical analyst thinks of these transitions. Here are those tunes played without repeats. So after a lot of head scratching over that cautious scatter plot and further consideration of the six tunes properties, here's a highly speculative provisional attempt at a cladogram or family pedigree for the Braze of Octatire. I suggest, though it's just a hunch, that the common ancestor to look for is likely to be in quadruple time. I trawled through as many tune books as I could get my hands on and was surprised to find that only one tune among hundreds caught my attention as being even slightly like our six. During this project, our six tunes, particularly the dances, have infested my brain. They became earworms. After a while, how can I keep my maidenhead morphed in my brain, but beyond consciousness, into a play for dance, Mundes, which was also that single tune that caught my attention as I leafed through my tune books. Could that possibly be... Nah. Aware of the dangerous subjectivity of the experience, I tried denying it, but the notion stuck and I'd like to explore it with you. But please take this idea with at least a ton of salt. It's the first section that's a bit like Maidenhead, Lennox Love and perhaps add a stretch, Octatire. Remember, I'm presenting this arguably reckless concept with all the caution I can muster, though it's a stubbornly persistent brain teaser. One thing about Playford's Mundes is that it is widely acknowledged to be an English derivative, a hundred years on, of a European bass dance, Mon Désir, published in Antwerp by Thielmann Cesato way back in 1551. The evidence is in the title and also in the shape of the tune. We can at least be confident of that relationship, but the rest of the experiment is dependent upon sheer, possibly crazy intuition. Let's take Mon Désir on a speculative evolutionary journey. After a while obsessed by a project of this sort, a kind of madness may creep in. Like the saints of old, in the depths of the night I had a vision. I woke around 3am, my brain suffused with the fantastic notion of three hymn tunes I was overlooking, that I must include in this discussion. After all, it's not unknown for popular tunes to be adopted by the church, sometimes surviving only as sacred pieces, but perfect reinstatement projects for musicians like the York Waits. Before I'd come round properly and rationalised what soon transpired to have been an intensively creative dream, I was excitedly planning which of my old hymnals and psalmodies I should consult come morning, if not right away. Absolutely convinced of the imperative to include the hymns of my nocturnal hallucination alongside the secular dances and songs. Eventually I calmed down and turned my mind to those slightly less wildly illusory thoughts about Mundes. Back to James Johnson, 
who, assisted by Burns from 1790, printed two old tunes proposed by Stenhouse to be ancestors or relatives of the Braes of Octatire, which indeed they very clearly are. He seems to have concluded that Oh dear Mini, what shall I do? was a precursor of Oh dear Mother, what shall I do? which was already circulating by 1725. Johnson printed two verses of Oh dear Mini, what shall I do? underneath the verse of Oh dear Peggy, what shall I do? labelled to have the tune Oh dear Mother, what shall I do? The tune is a direct lift from earlier sources, given a rudimentary bass accompaniment. The mini verses are set out separately as old words, this seems to be a historical comparison presented without information until you refer to Stenhouse's commentary in a separate section of the later 1839 edition. David McGuinness, director of Concerto Caledonia, has alerted me to the existence of two manuscript versions of O Mini, but I have been unable to study them. At 1710 and 1722, they are certainly earlier than this example, and would seem to suggest either that Minnie is an ancestral form of mother, or that the two are contemporary, one basic tune and two sets of verses. That verse within the music on Johnson's page, Oh Dear Peggy Loves Beguiling, occurs elsewhere. It quotes a single vocal air in two very similar, much earlier ballad operas, Alan Ramsey's Pastoral The Gentle Shepherds of 1725, where the tune is not provided, though it is in an edition of 1758, here just presumed known, which hints at its popularity by that date. It's also in Theophilus Sibber's Peggy and Patty, 1730, where the tune, in the simplest form we have available, is provided and it's recognisable. The Peggy version of the song evolved little during the mid-1800s. While the tune's simplicity in popular song persisted, it was evolving concurrently in higher musical art in the very capable hands of, in particular, James Oswald and Francesco Barsanti. In concluding this section, I sense that, so far, I have overemphasised my interpretation of the dance ancestry of the Braes of Octatire, whereas I suspect that the triple time songs might also be equally influential. This tune's evolution is, unsurprisingly, turning out to be a complex network of influences, changes and interconnections. Of the songs, I think we might place Oh Dear Minnie What Shall I Do as a little earlier than or contemporary with Oh Dear Mother What Shall I Do and Oh Dear Peggy a little later, Mother outlasting the others after adoption by composers. Concurrently, perhaps, Octatire emerged from both the Maidenhead Lennox Love dance tune repertoire and the parallel song form. It's impossible to identify the countless steps by which, unguided by any deliberate consciousness, old tunes interacted and evolved through performance, feedback, revision, blind watchmaker innovation. So here, to illustrate possible relationships leading from the songs, are Minnie's tune, followed by Mother's, both from Johnson, followed by the Braes of Octatire, as it appeared in Neil Gow's Tongue Twister Time, Complete Repository of Stress, Spays and Dances, 1817. There can be little doubt that Gow's assertion on the page that the octatire tune is the original of Oh Dear Mother, What Shall I Do? is entirely the wrong way round.
Once mother was in the repertoire, it was favoured by and elaborated by diverse poets, playwrights and composers. The earliest I've found is in Sibber's Pastoral. My understanding of these stage works is rudimentary, so please forgive any naive conclusions, while I keep going as best I can on the music in question. I'm presenting the Oh Dear Mother and Ochtataya tunes in a developmental sequence which can never be strictly chronological. The evolution of tunes is similar to the evolution of life, not a crude linear progression, but forming an unpredictable branching pattern. One embellished version derived from Oh Mother and provided with a figured bass was by an Italian working in London, Francesco Barsanti, who published his version with a figured bass which he specified can be played on violoncello or harpsichord. I've chosen the latter. There's a splendid performance of this arrangement on this CD, played beautifully on baroque oboe, cello and harpsichord. So next, two arrangements derived from Mother by cellist, enthusiastic arranger of Scots tunes and composer James Oswald, 1710-1769. The first is for solo German flute, that is the transverse flute rather than recorder, which was equally popular at the time. This composition becomes quite elaborate and ends with a jolly jig. We are very fortunate that one of the sweetest and most artful of the settings, James Oswald's from around 1740, has been recorded by a band specialising in this sort of music, Concerto Caledonia. So we can hear Oh Mother, note not Oh Dear Mother, What Shall I Do, played by top musicians on real instruments instead of my clinically precise, rather soulless computer simulation. Having been immersed for weeks in the music surrounding the Braze of Ochtertire, Listening to this track as I worked set me sobbing. Sentimental but unashamed. 
If you'd like to hear the whole sonata and loads of other great tracks, I heartily recommend Colin's Kisses.